All right, good morning. You ready to get in the Word? All right, get your scriptures in Matthew 28. My, my task in this first session is to talk about assessing the health of a church. I want to take us to a text that simply reminds us of our calling. You know this text, but uh, I, want us to, I want us to hear this again so that it governs everything that we're thinking about. And then we're going to spend some time uh, considering some ways that we can help churches think about what they're aiming to be. I think we have to do that first in order for us to assess where a church is in order to help a church move in the right direction. This is Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, which is, by the way, I would argue if you're going to memorize the Great Commission, you need to start where Jesus started. Uh, and that is verse 18. Then Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And does that, does that matter? Yeah, of course it does. Here's, here's what he says. I have a right to tell you what I'm about to tell you. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you, how long? Always, to the end of the age. Go. He says, and make disciples of all the peoples of the world. You're going to reach them. You're going to baptize them. You're going to teach them to do everything that I've commanded you. And you don't do this on your own. I am with you, and I'm with, with you always, even to the end of the age. And so he who has the authority to tell us what to do is also the one who walks beside us to get it done. And that's, that's good news for us. Our task is to make disciples. It is to reach people and lead them to make disciples themselves. I would contend that when Jesus told us this is what we're supposed to do, that he assumed we would get it done. That it's not just throwing this out there. He who leads us and guides us and empowers us and is, as Dr. Aiken pointed out, drawing to himself a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. God assumes that we're going to be useful for this task. And so we have to think about what is our role here. Well, as we think about the health of a church, as we think about assessing the health of a church, here's what I want us to think about. I want to ask you, first of all, what evidences come to mind for you that we are leading and walking beside churches that aren't always healthy? Give me some evidences of that, and do me this favor. Don't name any church and don't name any person, but tell me characteristics of what do you see? Churches that, that give evidence that they're not as healthy as they need to be. What's that? Okay, so you're not showing growth, okay? Okay, so you're not seeing attendance numbers, finance number. you're not seeing growth there. All right, what else? Lack of unity, which means division, okay? Inward focus, okay. Okay, zero or no baptisms or low baptisms. All right, lack of outreach in general. Okay, no process for discipleship. No vision planning. Unfilled leadership positions. You know, probably we could keep going, right, for the next hour and until chapel. And, and list these things, and that's, and that's reality. And what I, what I want us to think about is we're better at describing our problems than we are about casting vision for what we're supposed to be. And what often happens for us is when we go into a church to assess a church, we're not asking the questions about what are we aiming to be? What, is, what does a healthy church look like? And so consequently, all we do is we talk about the negatives and try to put band-aids on situations and never really resolve the patterns. And I think we have to think about what are we aiming to be? What does the Bible call us to be? And if you don't think that's the case, if I just throw out some areas of the church and, and ask you, do you think our church members would debate what a healthy church looks like in this area? If I were to throw out what is healthy worship, you think our church members would debate that? I, I think so. In fact, I know they would. Uh, 
And part of the reason we debate those things is because we don't ever really talk about what is this. We just say we need to be healthy, but we don't consider what that means. That's where I would argue when Rick Warren wrote The Purpose Driven Church in the middle 90s, he at least helped us to think about what does a healthy church look like. Now, there are all kinds of folks who didn't necessarily agree with what he did, but many of them turned around and wrote their own book on what does a healthy church look like. As we're all trying to address the question, but I'm, I'm not convinced that we have all of this in mind when we start assessing a church. Or if we have it in our mind, I'm not convinced that we help the people we're trying to help get it in their mind. If it's only in our mind, as, as a mission strategist, as a professor, as a church consultant, and we're just assuming that the people we're working with reach the same assumptions, we, we could be answering questions they're not asking and giving direction that they're not interested in. Uh, so I think we have to back up and say, what does a healthy church look like? So what I want to do is I want to show you what is, what is my model of a healthy church. I don't claim that this is the only one out there. It's certainly not the only one. I don't claim it's the best one. It is a workable one for me. All right, let, me give you, let me give you the text that I run to as I look for what does a healthy church look like. You can just jot them in your notes somewhere. Then we're going to start at the bottom of the model and work our way up. As, as I think about a healthy church, what am I looking for? First of all, Matthew 28 certainly governs all that we do. The Great Commission of Matthew 28, that we are to make disciples of all the peoples and teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. And so I start there. Then Matthew 22, the great commandment that we're to love God with all of our being and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so we have this mandate to reach the lost and make disciples. We have this mandate to love God and to love one another. Acts chapter 2, particularly the passage in Acts 2 that talks about the church that worshiped with awe and wonder, that daily the Lord added to the church, that picture of the early church in Acts chapter 2. And then the fourth text to which I go is the entire book of Ephesians. Uh, and, so, and what I mean by that is, here's what Paul does in Ephesians and in most of his writings that I would argue really help us think this through. If, if you know the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters are about theology. They're about who we are in Christ and what God has done for us. The last three chapters are about behavior, how we live how we carry out our faith. And I'll show you that in this model. What, what Paul does for us is he lays a theological foundation and then doesn't finish until he's taken us to application. And I think that's what we have to learn to do. It's not just theology. It's theology plus application that we have to think about as we think about a healthy church. So Matthew 28, Matthew 22, Acts 2, and Ephesians 1 to 6. So with that in mind, let me start at the bottom of this model. What I'm arguing for in this model is we have to, first of all, lay a strong theological foundation. And that is from all of uh, Ephesians 1 to 3. We know God and the power of his spirit. We understand who we are individually in Christ, corporately as his church. And the larger point is this. We have to help our people believe what the Bible teaches. And so often what happens is we don't have a strategic plan to get there. So if I ask local church pastors, do you want the people in your church to believe the scriptures? They're going to tell me what? Yes. If I ask them, do you want them to believe your statement of faith as a church? Most of the time they're going to tell me what? Yeah. Yes. My next question to them is, then what's your plan to get them there? And what, what do you think the plan is? They usually have an answer. Preaching in, teaching in particular in small groups, Sunday school, whatever you call those small groups. So what the pastors say to me is, we preach and we teach, and the implication is this. As long as you show up for everything that we do, you'll come out with an orthodox theology. And the understanding is that somehow our folks are just connecting all the dots and putting it all together. And they're, first of all, the assumption is they're actually listening to us when we're preaching. 
That's not always the case. We don't even listen to ourselves sometimes when we're preaching. And so, so that's not always happening. Then if we really think they're just bringing it all together and systematizing all of it into a theology that helps them know how to live on Monday, that's not happening, is it? Instead, here's what does happen. Let's, let's assume, and there aren't a whole lot of churches anymore that have a, have a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, Wednesday night, the same stuff that we had when I was a, when I was a young pastor. But if, let's assume you have that, and let's assume that you're actually teaching and preaching for an hour each time. That means the maximum time you get with your people teaching them is three hours, which leaves what? A whole lot of hours for them to get their theology someplace else. And it happens. They pick it up someplace else. And one of the reasons they're vulnerable to that is that we don't have a strategy to help people know what we believe and why we believe it. So one of my questions is, as we think about the health of a church, is what is your plan to lay the foundation that compels us to do what God's called us to do? You, you with me there? Now I'm going to come back and show you how I make application of that in a little bit. Then on top of that are the six pillars that I would argue are the six purposes of the church. Uh, Rick Warren and others uh, have five and others have other numbers. I would contend there are six. Let me just walk you through those. First of all, we exalt God through worship. We're, we're to love God with all of our being. The early church worshiped God with all and wonder. God just fell upon them and they sensed his presence. And then we evangelize the world through proclamation and missions. As the early church did, daily they shared the gospel, daily the Lord added to the church. As Jesus mandated to us, we're to make disciples of all the peoples of the world. And so as we teach the word, both in our culture and cross-culturally, we are proclaiming the good news to people who need to know Christ. Yes? So we know that's part of our, that's part of our purpose. Then equip believers through teaching and mentoring. Now this is, this is the purpose of the church that we usually call discipleship. And there, there are some reasons why I don't use the word discipleship here, not the least of which is I needed another E word to fit my, to fit my model. But that's not my, that's not my real reason for doing this. Uh, first of all, I think equipping is a, is a biblical word out of, out of Ephesians 4. We're to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And when I look at Matthew 28, this call to make disciples is much broader than what our people usually understand as discipleship. You tell me, if you talk about discipleship in your church, how, how do your folks typically hear that term? Class? Class that's taught information transfer. And there's, there's this sense of if I attend enough classes and do enough things that I'll come out on the other end a disciple of Jesus. And we're not always talking about what do we do with the knowledge. Sometimes it's just the transfer of knowledge and not the application of our lives. And so I think, I think we're countering some of that wrong understanding of discipleship by thinking about this purpose as equipping. We're equipping people. Yes, they have to know something to do it, but they also have to know how to do something. So we equip them through teaching, which we do regularly, and I argue through mentoring. It seems to me that as we look at how Jesus made disciples, how Paul made disciples, if we're not individually pouring our lives into somebody else, we're not fully fulfilling our responsibility. I think we have, that has to start with us. I, I tell pastors, the discipleship, the equipping in your church can be better tomorrow. It'll be stronger tomorrow if you go home and find a young person you're going to invest in. So we equip believers through teaching and mentoring. Then we edify others through ministry and service. The reason I use the word edify here is to think in terms of why are we ministering, why are we serving people? We do that so that they can come to know Christ and as they come to know Christ, we can help build them up and send them out as we minister and serve. That's in contrast to what I think some churches do, and that is that we do ministry and service to check off the boxes of, of these tasks. I remember years ago, I was, I was working with one of my students at Southern Seminary. He, he had come to seminary uh, from a six-figure job selling figurines. He had done really well in the business world, and God called him to ministry. 
And interestingly, God called him out of that high-paying business world to be a chaplain at a homeless shelter in downtown Louisville. And so it's just interesting to see how God transitioned him. Well, I would take my class down to see their work and participate in their work and ask him to talk to uh, our students about the needs of our city. And, and one of the things he said to us was is this. He said, I can get churches to come here and put on their gloves and put on their hair nets and stand behind the counter and put food on the tray to feed the hungry. So, but I can't get them to come back and disciple these folks. I can't get them to come back and teach them how to read. I can't get them to come back and teach them how to, how to set up a checkbook. I can't get them to come back and train them with job skills. What he said was, I can get them to come do just enough that they can go back and report to their church that they're doing ministry and service. Not so much that they get their hands dirty. So I want us to think beyond that. If all we're doing is ministry and service so we can report it in our business meeting, I think that misses the point of ministry and service. So edification matters to me. And then the, f the fifth purpose, encountering God through prayer. This is, this is the purpose that I add to my model that others don't include. It's not that they that they think prayer doesn't matter. It's just that they see prayer underneath everything and particularly underneath worship. And I understand that, except my, my problems or my questions are twofold here. It seems to me if you look at the scriptures and you find worship and evangelism and equipping and ministry and service and fellowship, you find all those things in the early church. Surely you find prayer just as much, if not more. In fact, you read through the book of Acts, and you're going to find prayer mentioned in most of the chapters because that marked them. It was DNA for them. And so I think as you look at the scriptures, you've got you to gotta figure out that prayer is more central than we usually make it in our churches. The, the other reason I say that we need to think about this as a purpose is when pastors say to me that prayer falls under something else, what usually happens to prayer? It gets pushed to the, to the back burner, and we wind up operating in our own strength. And so I'm arguing that as we look at the scriptures, that we need to raise our commitment to prayer as one of the primary functions of the church. And then we encourage one another through fellowship. Let me ask you again. You ask your folks to define fellowship, what are they going to say? Food, potluck. I think so. When I, when I became a Christian, I wasn't raised in a, in a Christian home. And I, uh, I was 13 when I became a believer. I remember the first time my church had a fellowship dinner. I had no idea what a fellowship dinner was. So I asked, what is this? And somebody said to me, we all bring a bunch of food and we put it on tables going down the hallway and we all pig out, basically. Uh, I said, all right, well, let's, let's try it. My family was such, my mom always worked, my dad always worked. We fixed our own meals. And so I'd go home for, for uh, dinner after school and I'd fix myself a grilled cheese or a fried bologna sandwich. It's just, it's just what we had. Well, I go to this fellowship dinner and goodness gracious, there's all kinds of, the first time I ever had real mashed potatoes in my life was at that fellowship dinner. <laughs> Up to then, we had these little buds that you put hot water in, and I thought those were mashed potatoes. I learned, no, they weren't. Uh, a meringue pie that, that hit the ceiling. Uh, this is, this fellowship thing, this is good stuff. I like that. But that's not the entirety of the New Testament picture of fellowship. When we gather together to provoke one another to do good works. And I think about how critical that is for the early church and for much of the church around the nations. You, you think about this. In the early church, they would gather on the Lord's Day for worship, and some of the brothers and sisters weren't there. And it wasn't because they were at the lake. It wasn't because they were on vacation. It wasn't because they were sleeping in. It was because they were in jail or they were dead. So you think they had to, in their fellowship, say to one another, we're going back out there anyway, provoking one another to good works? And we're not going to give up here. We're going to press on even if it costs us our lives. 
that's a picture of New Testament fellowship that I don't think we grasp well. So on top of this theological foundation, I lay out these six purposes, all of which have to be grounded in the word. And then if you work through the, the rooftop of the model, this is what Paul does in the latter three chapters of the book of Ephesians. He talks about our personal walk in much of those chapters, that this is how we're to walk, that we're to put off the old man and put on the, the new man, and we're to speak only those things that build up other people, and we're to lay aside filthy talk and foolish jesting, and we're not to let the sun go down on our, our wrath and all kinds of things he talks about as the gospel changes us. He talks to us about our family, that we are to love our spouses as Christ loved the church, and our spouses submit to us as under the, as under the Lord, and we submit to one another in the church, and then Paul explains what God does when he brings the church together and makes us one. And so we live out our faith in the church and then in the workplace. In Ephesians 6, he speaks of slaves and masters, but the implications are the same. That what we do in our context, we have to do it all for the glory of God. So what Paul does, it seems to me, is he in the first three chapters says, this is who you are in Christ. This is what God has done. Here's your theological foundation. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. What he says is, because of who you are in Jesus, this is the way you better walk. So he gives us the application. What he says is your faith has to be evident in every area of your life. And my contention is that some of the weakest parts of preaching and teaching today are a lack of application. So we don't help our people see how the gospel intersects with their lives on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and the rest of the week. Paul takes us there. This is who you are. This is the way you better live. Well, then you go up through the, the rest of the model. The cross is there. That's our message. But I also add to the top, to the world, because if our mandate is to make disciples of all the peoples, it is to preach the gospel to all creation, according to Mark 16, to all the nations in Luke 24, and Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, and Acts 1. Clearly, the healthy church is somehow touching the nations. Then, along the left-hand side of this, this for me is the whole picture of what Matthew 28 means when we're making disciples. We're teaching people the gospel. We're teaching them what it means to be a part of the body. We're leading them to Christ. We're helping them see how they flesh out their faith all the way to taking their faith to the ends of the earth. That's what it means to make disciples. So for me, this is, this is what a healthy church looks like. So what do I do with this then as I'm, as I'm helping a church think this through? Well, I want you to look at the model and help me to think some things through here. Let's assume that we as a church recognize that we need to do evangelism better, as most of our churches do. Here's how I use the model. I go down through the model to say, first of all, all right, what, what theological issues do I need to make sure we address in order for our folks to do evangelism? So what comes to mind for you? What kinds of theological things would you say, you know, we better address these things from the scriptures if we really want our people to tell the good news? What comes to mind? The okay, the reality of eternity, that, that we're not finished here. And that eternity brings judgment if you don't know Christ. The greatness of God. The greatness of God. Who, who is this God? This God who holds us accountable, who claims this right to hold us accountable. Who is he? Okay. Who is Jesus? And how is he our, our Savior? So Christology matters here. Anything else come to mind? Okay. How does one get saved? The lostness of humankind. In, in some cases, we're dealing with folks who don't believe they're lost or ever have been. I think we have to teach the reality that Jesus is the only way to the Father and that apart from a personal relationship with him, there is no salvation. 
Some, some years ago, I was working with a, with a D-Min student who was, who was trying his best to get his church to do evangelism. He had, he had been there a couple of decades, actually, and he came to us and said, I just can't get them to do it. I've tried. I've tried this. I've tried this. I've tried this. I've tried this. None of it worked. And then in one of his assignments, we required the students to do a theological survey of their church to find out where their church is. And here's what he discovered. 40% of his adult leaders believe that all good people go to heaven whether or not they know Jesus. And so we hear that, and why are they not doing evangelism? They don't, they don't see a need. And then our follow-up question is, well, you've been the pastor there for decades. How'd they get there? And when I know him, this is, this is a guy who believes very much in the exclusivity of the gospel. It's what he teaches. But he was assuming that his people were hearing him all the time. And so what we talked about is, now then you got to back up and ask the question, are you really teaching this in such a way that your people believe it that then compels them to do evangelism? Sometimes we're trying to equip people who don't believe in the need anyway. And then we wonder why they're not doing it. So, so that's where this model helps me to ask what theological questions do I need to make sure we're addressing. Then I go up through the model to ask the question, all right, does my personal walk matter in doing evangelism? Yeah, of course it does. Why? Because I can invalidate the message by the way that I live. The message still has power, but nobody listens to us when we live one way and speak another and then I go up through that model and ask the question, all right, what about family? Should I be equipping family members to reach family members? Yes. Should I be equipping spouses to reach their spouses? Yes. Should I be equipping parents to reach their children? Yes. Should I be helping children reach their parents? Yes. There's a reason so many times parents and others bring their kids to us as pastors. And I get it. In some cases, they don't want to, they don't want to uh, lead their children before the children are ready. They want some affirmation from someone who's a spiritual leader. But another reason they come to us is because we've never laid off on them the responsibility to do the work of evangelism in their home. And so this model says to me, all right, then are we doing this? If I need to train family members to do evangelism, is it happening? If it's not happening, here's a hole that I need to work on. And then I think about the church, and what are we doing church-wide to train people to do evangelism? And then the workplace. Should I be training my church members to reach their co-workers? Yes. How about the world? Should I be training our church to go cross-culturally to speak the gospel? Yes, not only because we may send them overseas, but why else? Because they may go across the street and find the world there. So I look at this model, and it just helps me to ask, all right, what's working and what's not working? What do we most need to focus on? What are some easy wins that we can get to at least get started in the right direction? What are the biggest holes that we see here that we need to address? And it just, it's just a way for me to say, if this is what we're aiming for, I at least have some idea of where we're going. Does that, does that make sense? Now, when I show this to pastors, what do you think they say to me? Say that again. Sometimes they'll say, we're already doing all these things. Sometimes, yes, they don't always say quite that, that honestly, <laughs> but, but you pretty much get that sense. You pretty much get that sense, like, I'm hiring you as a consultant to fix all this. And you're calling me to do a lot of hard work. But some of it, sometimes the response is it's overwhelming. Because they look at this model and they say, all right, we're not doing theology like we should. We're not worshiping like we should. We're not evangelizing. We we're not equipping. We're not, we're not doing any of this stuff. And so where do we start? And what happens is sometimes... You give up before you ever get started. So here's my word to all of us. Start somewhere. And make sure that you're not avoiding the theological foundation that's so critical to what we're doing. You're not going to fix it all. I'll talk more about that this afternoon. 
If you think you have to fix it all or that you're going to fix it all, you're never going to get there. What we have to do is keep pressing toward the goal. God, help us to become increasingly healthy. Because what will happen if you focus on, on exalting God through worship and you really strengthen your worship service, it's real possible that your attention to that is going to decrease your attention to something else, which means you've got to keep working on balance. But that's ministry. It means we're constantly asking the question, Lord, what do we need to do to keep moving in the right direction? My, my point is, again, here, I want us to know where we're headed. If we can't name where we're headed, then we're aiming for nothing. All right, got that? All right, let's, let's go on. Then, as we think about what we're doing as a church and how we evaluate the health of a church, I'm going to take you to some old-fashioned church growth terms that are, are still helpful to me. Church growth writers talk about four different kinds of, of church growth. I'm going to lay them out for you, then come back and talk about them. Expansion growth is numerical growth. And there are different ways that numerical growth can happen. I'm going to talk about that in sources of church growth here in just a minute. But for now, well, all I want you to know is, if I'm evaluating the health of a church, I do want to know, is there evidence that you are reaching more people? And that is a numerical question. I get it that we have to have some fear of becoming idolatrous of numbers. I get that. And none of us wants to increase numbers at the expense of the gospel. But if Jesus calls us to make disciples and it's not happening, then I'm going to ask why. Occasionally, I'll have a, I'll have a pastor say, well, God's just using me to reduce us to his remnant. <laughs> Which sounds incredibly spiritual, just incredibly wrong. Uh, sometimes that happens. But sometimes we hyper-spiritualize to find our excuses for not reaching anybody. So I think we have to ask numerical questions. I think it's right to ask that question. The next kind of growth is internal growth, what we would typically call spiritual growth. This is, by the way, the most difficult kind of church growth to measure. Expansion growth we can measure. How? You look at numbers. There are more numbers here this week than there were last week. You have some evidence of something happening. Spiritual growth is hard. One, because we don't ever ask the question, so we would differ on how do we evaluate spiritual growth. You, you tell me for a minute. Tell me some things you would look for if you are helping a church set up a means by which you're evaluating the spiritual growth of your people what would you look for? Increased number of people serving. Okay, so people serving, using their gifts. So they're not there just to sit. They're using their gifts. Good. What else? Prayerful All right, prayerful dependence. And how do you measure that? But I think it's, I think it's a right question. What else? Disciple All right, disciple making. So they're not just gathering it in. They're turning around and reproducing themselves. All right, members reaching others. So they're out doing evangelism. Not because we tell them they have to, but because it's DNA for them. Okay, you want to see that they're growing. It's one thing to be a baby in Christ who's just hungry, who's zealous, who's a brand new believer. It's another thing to be a longer term believer who acts like a baby. True? And so we want to see that they're, we want to see, give me evidence that you're growing spiritually. Okay, sometimes it's just listening to what are their questions. Okay, all right, what's, what's our process for growing healthy leaders who walk with God and are leading well? Okay, all right, so you get all this, you, you, you list all those things, and this is, this is hard. This means you have to be in people's lives. It means you have to be walking beside them. It means you have to be asking tough questions sometimes. And so far too often, the way we get around this is just not ask the question at all. And we settle for as long as our numbers are increasing, we're not asking the harder question about are people becoming more like Christ. 
All right, a third kind of growth is extension growth. Extension growth is church planting in a similar culture. Church planting in a similar culture. And usually that means same language. You're not crossing linguistic barriers to, to plant the church. The other side of that is bridging growth, and that's church planting cross-culturally. Church planting cross-culturally. So we are making disciples of the peoples of the world, whether they live around us or we are going to them. Now, you got all those? Here's my contention, and here's how I would use these types of church growth to help a church assess itself. I think we can make a case for a healthy church ought to be a part of all four of these kinds of growth. Now, that doesn't mean that they're all happening at once. I, I get it that a brand new church may be taking off numerically, and now they've got to figure out how to help people grow spiritually. They may not yet be at the point where they're reproducing themselves by church planting. But it seems to me as we look over... Uh, a period of time for a congregation, we ought to see evidences of this kind of growth. And for us as, as Southern Baptists in the room, we have, I think, a workable method that every church can be doing these things. By doing what you're doing through associational work, through our state conventions, through the IMB, through the North American Mission Board, we can, we can be a part of this. We may not be hands-on all the time. We certainly need to be more than just saying we're giving to the cooperative program, so we're doing this. That's not going to go far in helping people get a burden for doing it. We have to help people know how those dollars are being spent and, and help them to know why what we're giving is making a difference. But, but it seems to me this is all at our feet in order to help our churches see... You can reach people and grow numerically. You can make disciples and grow internally. You can be a part of church planting, even if you think your church can't do that. My first church, I started pastoring in Ohio in 1981, had 19 people in the first church, a, a country church in southwestern Ohio. Most of them were related to each other. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a fascinating first ministry. Uh, but I tell you what, my first paycheck as a Southern Baptist were the combined funds from my local church, and they didn't give very much of it, uh, my local association, my state convention, and the old home mission board. And so my very first paycheck as a Southern Baptist came from Southern Baptist. Uh, to this day, I'm grateful for and Now my paycheck comes from Southern Baptist. So, so I'm... I'm grateful. So I saw, I saw it working. I got to do full-time ministry because we cooperated together. When our young church started to look at our, our budget, and we're trying to figure out what are we going to give, and, and we're wrestling through how much do we give to the cooperative program. And I'm not arguing this has to be a minimum. I just want to tell you this story. One of, one of my deacons said to us in a business meeting, and I'm talking about business meetings where we voted on everything for our multiple hours uh, and so he raised his hand and said as we think about our budget the denomination's been really good to us we get to do what we do because they've helped us pay brother Chuck's salary they helped in some other ways he said it seems to me that even if it feels like we can't do this we ought to be giving at least 10 percent of our giving to work beyond us and that little church set out to say that's that's at least our minimum and though we were running 19 20 25 we grew a lot over those first couple of years we weren't in the place where we could support a church plant on our own we were not sending out missionaries on our own but what i learned was that we were part of something bigger and that was okay in fact, it made us feel like we mattered. And I, and I think we can do this.
And so as, as I'm helping a church think about their health, I'm looking at this model of where are the things you need to address, but it's not just that. I also want to know what's the product of what you're doing. Do you see evidence of you are growing numerically, and if so, how? I'm going to take you there in just a minute. Do you have evidence that the people in your church are growing spiritually? That's clearly connected to the previous model, that if I'm teaching them to worship and evangelize and equip, we're, we're talking about how they're fleshing out their faith. And then are we working so that we're not a self-centered congregation, we're from the beginning thinking about how we invest in others beyond us. So I want to ask those questions. I want to assess not only through the model, but also through this. Now, let's go to sources of church growth. A further question I think we have to ask is, if a church is growing numerically, if a church is growing numerically, I want to know what is the source of that growth. You know these, these terms. Obviously, I want to know how much of your growth is conversion growth. Reaching non-believers, baptizing them as evidence of their faith, joining the local body, and learning to walk with Christ. What percentage of your growth is conversion? What percentage is transfer growth? Some that is legitimate. We move from one location to another. We need to be serving close to where we live. We're in a church where the gospel is not being preached, we have to make some hard decisions. But an awful lot of transfer growth is nothing less than personal preference. And we wind up swapping sheep. In, in Donald McGavern's terms, uh, McGavern talked about if, a, if you had a $10 bill in your pocket, which I, which I don't have, uh, and you took it out and put it in the other pocket, you've transferred the dollars, but you're not any richer. And, and sometimes that's what transfer growth does. We, we transfer the dollars around, but the kingdom's no richer. And so I at least want to know. Again, I, I'm not arguing there's no place for transfer growth, but I want to know if, if the church is growing by transfer growth, What's the background of that? Then there is biological growth that I define a little bit differently than others. So let me tell you how others define it, and then I'll tell you how I define it. Some historically have defined biological growth as the kids of church members becoming believers. Here's why I don't define it that way. Because it seems to me when our children recognize their lostness, come to the place at whatever level they are to turn from their wrong and trust Jesus as their Savior, that's conversion growth. And, and sometimes pastors will say to me, well, we, we baptized 10 last year, but nine of those were only our children. And I, I get what they're saying, but that seems to me to downgrade the significance of reaching our own kids. It's still conversion growth. So biological growth, I define this way. It is church members having babies. It's you're increasing numbers because your nursery's filling up. Which, as you well recognize, tends to happen more in a young church than an older church. And then there's a fourth kind of growth that I add to this list, what I call a tender growth. Here's, here's a tender growth. A tender growth is your numbers in your church attendance are increasing because you have people who are regularly attending, but they're not taking any further steps. They're doing what Josh Harris years ago called dating the church. Uh, they're, they're hanging out with the church. They're dating the church. They're reaping the benefits of the church, but they're not going to make a commitment to the church. Still, though, your numbers are increasing because they're coming. So when I look at this and I help a church assess their health, I want to know if you're reaching people, how are you reaching them? And you recognize this. Churches that are growing, for the most part, in North America, they're growing by what kind of growth? It's most often transfer. And I think we have to ask hard questions about that. It concerns me that sometimes we celebrate growth without asking about the source. And so we put on our platforms leaders whose churches are swapping sheep, but they're not reaching many lost people. 
And I think we have to ask that question. So I hope you get my point. Right now, I'm just asking, all right, how do we assess the health of a church? What are we aiming for? That's, that's the model. That's the purpose for my model. And then beyond that, I do think we have to ask numerical questions. I think we have to ask internal questions. Uh, are we growing? And if so, how are we growing? Are we reproducing congregations by, by church planting in a similar setting, in a cross-cultural setting? If we're growing, are we growing by transfer growth, conversion growth, biological growth, a tender growth, a combination of those? If we don't ask those questions, we'll get comfortable with increased numbers, and we may not be making much difference anyway. This pushes us beyond getting satisfied with growing the crowd. All right, you with me there with all of that? All right, now, I want to take you one more direction as I think about how I would a challenge a church to evaluate where they are, to assess where they are. And I want to do that by introducing you to a person that I call Disciple Dave. And ladies, you can choose the name that you wish for ladies. Here's what I want us to think about with Disciple Dave. Some of you remember that when Rick Warren wrote, Bill Hybels wrote back in the, in the 90s. They began talking about the, the, the picture of the lost person in their community that they were trying to reach. You may remember Saddleback Sam, Unchurched Harry. There, there were just these different nomenclatures. And I don't think that was necessarily wrong because they were at least getting into their community and figuring out who's there, which most of our churches weren't doing. And so they're asking demographic questions that we have to ask. I think that was the right question. So we all begin to think about, as we, as we begin to read those books, all right, who are the people in our community? That, again, is the right question. So I think that's good for us to ask. I'll talk more about that this afternoon. What we weren't asking was this question. Suppose I'm an unchurched person in your community, and one of your members shares the gospel with me. I hear the gospel. The Spirit of God breaks my heart over my sin. I come to a place of, of repentance and trust, and I become a believer, and you baptize me into your local body, and I become a part of your church. Suppose I'm under your church's ministry three years. And I use three years because we live in a transient culture. Many of us do. So if I'm under your teaching, under your preaching, under your leadership for three years, I'm a brand new baby Christian over there. Three years from now, what do you want me to be? If I'm a disciple, if you're producing a disciple in me, what does disciple Dave look like? And I'll give you some areas where I think we've got to ask those questions. Um, I think we have to answer this question. What does a disciple look like? Not just what does your church look like, but individually, what do you want us to become under your leading? D does the question make sense? All right, so again, some of these things are going to be duplicates of how do we evaluate spiritual growth, but think more generally with me. What are the areas that you would want to address in deciding what Disciple Dave ought to look like in your church? What are the general areas you would say, we've got to at least ask questions about this kind of thing? All right, Christ-likeness. So it's lifestyle. Okay? Are they, are they carrying out their ministry and reproducing themselves in others? Anything else? Okay. Are they using their gifts? And so are they serving somehow through the church? Let me show you some of the areas that I would say. I do think that Disciple Dave ought to have knowledge. And that can be as simple as knowledge of the books of the Bible. It could be knowledge of the history of the church, meaning your local church. It could be more broadly history of the, the, the larger church, perhaps. Uh, it, it could be knowledge of who are your staff members. All, all I'm saying here is it seems to me that we ought to think in terms of we want Disciple Dave to know something. And what are those things that we want him to know three years down the road? 
And if we don't, if we can't answer that question at some level, what happens is we're expecting him to live up to something that we've never stated. And we're holding him accountable for becoming something that we've never described. And then we get really frustrated with him for never getting close to what we've never told him we want him to be. You with me? So I think knowledge matters. Ministry skills. It's, it's a 1 Corinthians 12 understanding that God puts his body together as he wishes. And he gives each of us as he wishes. Some of us are feet. Some of us are hands. Some of us are eyes. Some of us are ears. But none of us is here by accident. We're all here by design. And part of our task is to help this brand new believer figure out what his giftedness is and how he might serve in the church. So that raises the question for me then, if I know that I want Disciple Dave to be here doing ministry somehow through the church three years down the road, what's my next question? What's my plan to get him there? And again, if we're holding them accountable for this, but we don't have a strategy in place to get them there, we're just going to be disappointed. But until we can describe what we want Disciple Dave to be, I think we, we're not ready to move forward. Spiritual disciplines. I do think three years down the road that we want a new believer reading the word, yes? Praying. I would argue fasting. Finding time just to get alone with the Lord. I want to help disciple Dave to get there. Not just in here, and here are my verbs here. I don't want to just tell him what to do. I want to teach him how to get there. And those are two distinctly different things. What we often do with the spiritual disciplines is we tell people what they must do, but we don't teach them how to do it. When I, when I became a believer, my, my pastor gave me my first Bible. It's 1974. So he gives me a King James Version. I'm a 13-year-old. He gives me a King James Version, hardback red award Bible. Anybody remember those? So it's my first Bible. He said, you need to start reading this. I never read any of this. So I sit down, I'm reading through Genesis. I didn't know about Adam and Eve and a garden and a snake I will, I will never forget the first time I saw a rainbow after reading Genesis 9. And it just stopped me. I said, wow, this is what God said. That's fast. That gives me chills now to think about that. So I read through Genesis, and I'm on board. I get to Exodus. I'm a 13-year-old guy. The mountains are shaking. Lightning's crashing. Thunder is roaring. The sea's Going back, Egyptians are drowning. I says, this is good stuff. So I devoured Genesis, Exodus, and then I got to Leviticus. And, and guess what I did? I didn't skip it because I didn't know you were allowed to. I, I Seriously, I, I just figured if you didn't read the third chapter, you had to quit. So... That's what I did. I quit because my church told me to read. They didn't teach me how to read. We do the same thing with prayer. We tell, we don't teach. We do the same thing with giving. We tell, we don't teach. We do the same thing with evangelism. We tell, we don't teach. And telling only is always going to lead to defeat. Because unless we equip people to do what we're asking them to do, they're not going to get there. Then we're going to get frustrated with them and tell them more loudly. And then we just get to this vicious cycle of why don't they listen when maybe we haven't taught them. So I want to make sure we're teaching them spiritual disciplines. Then, next, participation. That is, I, I want them there. There. 
I want them participating in worship services. I want them participating in small groups. I want them participating in outreach events. I do want them involved. I want them actively involved. And so I know that three years down the road, I don't want Disciple Dave just to be showing up on Sunday morning, soaking it in and doing nothing more than that. True? We want him to do it more than that. But I've got I've to have that in mind as I'm thinking about the health of my church. Then theology. I do want Disciple Dave to know what we believe and why we believe it. I do want Disciple Dave to know how do we apologetically speak the gospel to people who don't believe the word of God is the word of God. How do we back up to address those issues? I want him to know basic Bible teaching. And you heard my point before. I don't think our folks just naturally make all the connections. We have to have a plan to lay that theological foundation. And then lifestyle. That is, I want Disciple Dave to walk like Christ. I, I want him to be rejecting sin, to be walking away from temptation, to be living in victory, to be leading his home well, to be doing the things that mark believers. And you could probably add some things to this, but, but, but get my point. I start out by saying I want us to think holistically about what does a healthy church look like. We're evaluating that in terms of the model and in terms of the types of growth, sources of growth. And then we bring this down to right, what does a healthy disciple look like in my church? And how am I going to get my church to be healthy if I'm not producing healthy disciples? And how do I bring all of these together? Ideally, as we're laying a theological foundation, we're leading people to worship and evangelize and equip and edify others and encounter God in prayer and fellowship and then carry out their faith and their personal walk, their family, their church, their workplace, and to the nations. What are we doing? We're, we're being used of God to make disciples. But where I want us to land this morning is unless we can stop and say this is what we're aiming for in disciples and in a disciple-making church, we're often aiming for something unstated. And I think that makes it increasingly difficult for us to assess the health of a church. All right. Does that make sense? So what does this mean for starting points? You can imagine, as you work with the churches you work with, if you're walking them through all these things, we could land where we started this morning, and that is that all you see are the negatives. All you see are, we're not there, we're not there, we're not there. We never even thought about what Disciple Dave looks like. There's so much here that I don't know if I can even lead the church to do this. Sometimes it's not uncommon when you walk alongside a church and help them in a church consulting relationship Sometimes pastors who are already weary before you ever get there begin to hear that this is what it's going to take to make a difference and they're too exhausted to press on. They, they go someplace else. What I want us to help leaders do is to rejoice in the little things, start somewhere, and trust the Lord to do something. I'm going to unpack that some more uh, after lunch. But we have to help people see we're not calling you to fix everything. Because it's not going to happen. But I want you to start somewhere. And I want you to rejoice at every little glimpse of God's glory that you see in your congregation. So if it's that member who hasn't been there for six months and he shows up again this Sunday because something just burdened his heart, then I'm going to rejoice over that. Now, might we run five fewer this week than we had last week? Yep. Could I be disappointed at that? Yeah, I could be. But I don't want to be disappointed at that at the expense of not rejoicing because this brother came back. And so I, I want us to help people to, to always look for, 
always look for something God is doing in your church now. now in some churches, honestly, you got to look a lot harder. True? Like forever, it seems, and deeply. And the best you find might be that, hey, somebody at least opened the door today. But somebody did that. Somebody faithfully did something so the church can do something. So I want us to start somewhere, rejoice at what we see, and trust the Lord to do something.